three. Hi, my name's Jessica. We're here in New York City at Notel, which is a headquarters as a service space, and we're hosting Crypto Tuesday for Social Good. Um, each month, the first Tuesday of the month, we talk about a new blockchain technology and how it's helping better society. And this week, we are featuring Civil, and um, Nicole Bode is speaking on behalf of Civil. But before she goes on, we're going to go around and talk to some people who have decided to attend our event. And some people have come before, and some people have just decided to check it out. So let's see who's here. Hi. OK, hey, I'm back. I remember you. OK. How are you? <laughs> Good, how are you? I'm fantastic. Just enjoying crypto in New York. It's a great day to be here. Nice. OK, refresh my memory, if you'd like, about how you got interested in cryptocurrencies and what you're, what, why you're really here. Sure. So actually, I was living in Spain for a while. I was working as an English teacher. I didn't have a lot of money at the moment, so I stumbled down the blockchain rabbit hole, watched a really cool documentary on Bitcoin, taught myself how to trade, and learned all about the different coins that they are. No the way. Did there. you know that I was a teacher too? Really? Yeah, in South Korea. That's amazing. I wish I had known. South Korea is an incredible place to teach English too. Yeah. We come from similar universes. Yeah. And now I we're both so. in this little singularity <laughs> that is. Yeah. Fancy. What are you doing now? Um, right now I work as I work for a blockchain infrastructure company called IG17 and I'm also developing a high-frequency trading platform called Annex TS, which uh, is going to go live soon. But right now, we're looking for investors before we launch our ICO. Amazing. So how many people are on your team? Uh, so we have six based in New York, and we have a couple developers who are based in Toronto who develop the uh, artificial intelligence that drives the social media analytics that is present on our platform, which, by the way, will be the first exchange that offers it. So... <laughs> How did you get connected with those people? So, uh, to be completely honest, coming to meetups like this, uh, mingling with people who come from a similar background and who are also driven by the principles of blockchain that I think are really especially represented at Crypto Tuesdays, which is networked integrity, uh, inclusion, and uh, an entirely new financial e uh, ecosystem in which all have a, have a say and all can be a part of it. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I think the folks who come to Crypto Tuesday are mo more focused on the long-term effects that the technology is going to have versus just making money on an investment. Would you agree? I agree entirely. And I would say, I would ask, have you experienced, well, when I first came to New York and I was discovering a lot of people in the streets, coming to a lot of different meetings around the city, I found that there were two types of people. Mm -hmm. uh, people who only knew about Bitcoin because they wanted to turn it into fiat for more money, and people who liked Bitcoin and cryptocurrency because of the real social values and the possibilities that were present with this new technology. So, yeah, I would say that there's still that divide, but um, it's interesting there was like all this this initial wave of like, you're cool if you're interested, mm -hmm. and so it kind of didn't matter which side of the coin you were on and then now it's now it matters more when people are interacting and um, I think that's good and bad because it brings out more of the issues that we need to talk about. Absolutely. And there's great projects like Civil for example tonight or there we go and yeah. there's and so it's <laughs> cool that you know I guess there's a space for everything and at least uh, well, at least on Tuesdays, at least we had these events, you know, there's a lot of people who come here who are aligned by those similar values. How can we use blockchain to do A, B, C and actually create human value, value that we can, value that's not just money and putting more money into places where uh, there doesn't need to be more. Would you say that your viewpoints have changed since you first got interested and, and like, what are some of the main ways that they have changed. So I think that my my viewpoints have only been amplified the more I've kind of climbed down this rabbit hole because I discovered that with cryptocurrency, there's this massive, I like to call it liberation and liquidity for all. Because now we have this platform where early adopters can really reap the rewards of learning about this technology through uh, through financial independence, financial freedom. And I think that that's a very important part of blockchain and that, you know, we see this uh, by a lot of leaders in the space, such as the CEO of Binance, for example, CZ, uh, I think Qingping Zhao. And he has said, you know, we no longer work for profit. 
We don't need money. Instead, we're just working to spread this technology and allow more access to people who need the financial liberation that it provides Excellent. for early investors. So do you think that governments should um, impose regulations on people raising their own money or on who can control the governance of a chain? Well, I think what's interesting is we're starting to see a lot of actors, uh, we'll say that a lot of governmental actors in the space, declaring that regulations must be placed for, here's the buzzword, at consumer protection, protection of the average consumer, right? I think that these regulations are mostly in place to uh, kind of stronghold, to hedge against the market, to make sure that this massive transfer of wealth doesn't get too out of control. Because I think what blockchain truly represents and what Bitcoin originally represented was a complete separation of money and state, where currency, a, visual, uh, a virtual coin, a virtual asset that is completely separate from the physical world and only exists in this virtual space is now a sovereign property of the individual. And I think that is revolutionary. And I think that the if the internet is to information, then blockchain is uh, to value in that sense. I think that blockchain is now uh, kind of revolutionizing the way we think about value. But you have to be careful um, about which 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 projects you follow and which coins you invest in and which people you talk to. Yes, definitely, because anybody can take hold of this technology to raise their own money or make their own money through the right investments, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's kind of like investing in a stock market. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to be investing in oil or do you want to be investing in something else? Like, Absolutely. What is your money actually doing to the world? So. And essentially, I think that's what's so cool about cryptocurrency is because people aren't truly investing, rather they're speculating. They're look at platforms like EOS, for example, which recently has had billions of dollars pumped into it. We saw the price go up 50% in the last week, rather 70% in the last week, something like that, something crazy. And that's because there's a lot of people who are buying into a thought. They're buying into a vision of what this platform could possibly provide for humanity. Now, there's lots of other projects out there. Now, do I think governments should regulate some of this activity? Yes, but I think regulation should be put in place at a point where it doesn't hinder innovation, but rather provides more of a transparent lens so that average consumers and people who may not be maybe non-technical people have a little bit more information about what they're investing in. Um, we see this demonstrated in countries such as Israel, Malta, Russia not entirely, but that's an interesting space to see where cryptocurrency is kind of being used and where blockchain technology is developing. But Malta, for example, is a phenomenal place for uh, exchanges to be placed because the prime minister is working very well with regulations oh, so as not to hinder innovation, whereas the American, you know, well, the SEC here in America is quite uh, restrictive. And I think it's simply because they don't understand what digital scarcity is. They don't understand the true values and the technology that they're dealing with. Totally. Yeah. Okay. Tell us your name again. My name is Sophia Gavrilla, and I have a Twitter. It's at Sophia Gavrilla with a P H, one L, and a V in my last name. All right. And the company again? So it's called Infinigon Group. Infinigon Group, and we're located here in uh, in New York, and we're working on some very exciting projects. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shall we move on to your friend? Sure. Go on. Sam. Sam. I don't know if I can be anywhere near as articulate as her, but um, <laughs> I'll try. Okay, all right, give it a shot. Uh, Sam, uh, so originally originally started uh, importing cars, completely different space than um, blockchain, but uh, in the car dealership, we uh, actually started mining Ethereum, started making a little bit of money with it, using the electricity at the dealership, started profiting from it, selling it, paying the rigs off seeing a return on investment within a few months and uh, yeah we are expanding that operation and eventually hopefully be more profitable with that than the cars and hopefully just mine ethereum for the rest of my life and live off that very interesting um why ethereum and why what brought you here uh tonight here Sophia a bit, but uh, you know, <laughs> a anything to do with crypto. I live in East Village, so I'm you know, 20 minutes from here. There's a lot of meetings. I've been to a few. Uh, 
uh, Crypto Tuesdays is one of the better ones because it's actually about social good. It's not just, hey, what are you mining? What are you buying? What's going to make me the best return on investment? Um, they actually talk about how it can you know, help. Uh, I remember a couple weeks ago, there was someone that had a platform for uh, homeschooling and using the blockchain for the videos that were produced. And uh, it's just you know, stuff like that is why I come to meetings like this. Very cool. Um, so, what do you think about governance, and what do you know about civil? Since we're going into that, civil as in the uh, the speakers that we have here today. Anything yet? I am completely oblivious of civil, but uh, regulation-wise, we are considering doing an ICO for you know the mining that we're doing. So instead of using uh, private funds that we have been. Uh, we can get pretty much crowdsourced our mining operation and pretty much offer people uh, a token with value that represents how big our farm is. The bigger the farm, the more valuable the token is. And, and um, yeah, so I know a little bit about the SEC and, and regulations, and um, we're going to try to do Reg A2, which is $50 million limit, and uh, you have to have a credit. Um, there's lawyers, it gets pretty complicated. I just know the basics of it, but um, governance is a complicated topic, and we want to consider ourselves a security and hopefully save ourselves from fake in the future. So, have you gotten your team together of lawyers and? Uh, I mean, we've spoken to a few uh, attorneys, and most are pretty much just oblivious to the aspect of crypto in general. So there's services that offer ICOs, uh, I guess, compliance for the SEC rules. But for the most part, you need to do the research yourself, and the lawyers are just going to apply. You, you get a, a securities lawyer, and he'll apply to the SEC for you. But you need to make sure your, um, your ICO has the compliance built into the white paper. So... Hopefully we can pull that off and get a good security lawyer. So um, if you could choose one exchange to be placed on, which would it be? Um, I do like Binance, but uh, I mean, if we're the number five coin on Coinbase, you know, that, that wouldn't be a problem either. But <laughs> probably, probably Binance. Yeah. That's asking a lot. Yeah, you know, shoot for the stars. Okay, well, if you need to get your team together, tell your your name again and how they can reach you. Uh, well, we're still private in our, our mining, but yeah, I mean, I'm Sam Risberg. Uh, our coin is going to be called Gita Coin. It should be the white paper should be live within about a month, and um, yeah, it's that's only two or three of us, and we're so far the biggest mining operation in Central Florida. So hopefully, the East Coast soon. Nice. Thanks so much. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Guido Molinari. I am a partner at Prism Group. Uh, we are a blockchain economics and governance design firm. And we are very excited tonight to co-host this event together with Crypto Oracle. And we thank, of course, Notel for being our sponsor. Excellent, excellent. So how did you get involved with PRISM? So we came together towards the end of last year. I had been personally involved in crypto, more kind of on a personal side for about a year and a half before that. Yeah. And together with a group of other people, we realized that there was a need for economics and governance services in the space. Uh, I happen to know a number of economists. I'm married to one. <laughs> And uh, we realized that you would need uh, for you know, the token incentives, for the market design, for the governance to be structured correctly, to involve uh, you know, um, top-level economists in the similar way that Silicon Valley Company rely on economists from the major universities in the US. Uh, so if today you, know, you go to Uber or Airbnb or Google or Facebook, they hire the top economists coming out of Harvard, MIT, Stanford. And we basically want to offer the same opportunity for companies in the blockchain space, and that's why we created Prism. Okay, great. So um, how many economists are on the team? We have five economists on the team, uh, and we are looking to grow. Um, of course, economists, as people might know, they are very skeptical people. 
So it hasn't been easy to persuade them that you know blockchain is more than just Bitcoin and there is actually something to the technology that will be you know incredibly world changing. Uh, we are though very excited because we are going to have um, next month in June for the first time a Nobel Prize winner in economics, Oliver Hart, speaking about blockchain governance here in New York. We're still finalizing details, so that's a very big scoop. And uh, we think that people like Oliver and other other you know luminaries in their field can contribute a lot because you know the, you know economics is a 250 year old uh, science. And a lot of the things that we have learned over those 250 years can be directly applied to the um, issues that many founders are facing now in blockchain. So where is this talk going to be? Uh, here in New York. Uh, we haven't defined a venue yet, but we will certainly have news uh, soon. If you want to follow, I mean, we publish uh, news on our blog, which is Prism Group, blog on Medium, and also on our Twitter, which is at Prism News. Okay, excellent. And can you tell us more about the structure of your team and who else is on the team other than... Sure. Um, so uh, we have economists and we have people like me. I handle partnerships and business development here in New York, but we are a very decentralized team. We have a person in Singapore, in uh, London, in Vienna, in Milan, and uh, in the U.S. we cover pretty much, you know, uh, Miami, uh, New York, Boston, Chicago, Denver, uh, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, and Austin. So. We are, you know, we try to be local to all the major hubs where companies are. Um, and the people that really do the business development go to events such as tonight and meeting with founders, meeting with investors, meeting with, you know, other service providers and try to plug in our services. Again, we're very focused on the economic governance, but we realize that our system will be, you know, part of a greater scope of services that most teams need. So, for example, PR or marketing or technical development. We don't do any of that, but of course we work with people that have the th those type of services that we can provide. Okay, so how big is the team, do you, roughly? We're 15 people right now. 15, yeah. and then um, the larger network, could you give a... So a we have 25 that? partners, uh, so these are organizations, again, that go from being you know, investors, like at Oracle, and uh, PR firms, uh, marketing, technical developers, uh, crowdfunding platform like Indiegogo, for example. So these are all, you know, um, players in the space and they rely on our expertise on our domain which is again the economics and how also the economic structure of the governance of systems and similarly we rely on their expertise you know in other fields that are needed okay great anything else to add well uh, we are actually having an event during blockchain week in new york it's going to be on monday night the 14th at also together there with Oracle, and it's going to be on token economics one of our economists is going to speak and we're going to have the ceo from republic crypto which is coin List sister company speaking as well about these important topics. For anybody who's interested about token economics, I would highly recommend coming to the event on the 14th. Okay, and you said it's a uh, blockchain week, or what's the during blockchain week, New York? Yes, that's the week for you. It's basically when all the big conferences are going to happen. So there's going to be Ethereal. There's going to be the Women in Blockchain event, and this is during Consensus, which is probably one of the biggest conferences in the year. Okay, so it's it's through Consensus. It's a side event. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Is there a cost? Uh, yes, there is a cost, but tickets I think are around fifteen dollars. So it's it's a limited cost, just to make sure people show up. Yeah, very affordable. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. Do we have time for one more? All right, let's see who else we have in the room. <laughs> What's up? <laughs> All right, cool. Oh. We're trying to move everybody. Oh, wait. oh Well, unless you want to be interviewed. No, no, I don't want to be interviewed. <laughs> <laughs> He's good, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, yeah, we'll, okay. We'll connect. Like, we absolutely will connect. Who can I pick on? Hey, Luigi. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, no, be terrific. I, I spoke so much for be terrific. You guys are. Yeah, this is a good friend. Who are you guys with? Yes, so, um, well, I'm one of the co-organizers of this event, but we want to hear more about our attendees, so who are you guys? Do you work together? Soon to be. Mm -hmm. um, nice. So I'm Kevin Valentine. <laughs> I work with Reflective Venture Partners. Mm -hmm. We're the ecosystem development fund for our chain. Okay. So our chain is a uh, decentralized compute platform. Uh, 
akin to Ethereum or the others. The uh, difference there is that it's actually scalable. Um, there's some math behind it that makes it actually concurrent, right? And so there's concurrency, there's, uh, there's uh, safety because of uh, formal verification. And um, my job is to find really interesting projects and invest in them. And so uh, that's my job, and Luigi is uh, with uh, Proof. And um, yeah, so Proof is a uh, content validation platform that uh, is working on solving one of the issues of fake news. So we'll be announcing a lot more uh, in the coming future about that. And it's a little early right now. So. Yeah, 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 sort of uh, put them on the spot. Yeah. Do you guys want to share how you'll be working together? Uh, soon to be. Yeah. Okay. Two more to come. <laughs> more to come. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. But so, yeah, but but we're having actually for those if this is live at all, mm -hmm. we'll be in San Francisco tomorrow. Uh, our chain will be having a uh, uh, meetup where Greg Meredith will be speaking and uh, going into more about our chain, and we'll be out there uh, taking meetings with folks in San Francisco. So. Really excited just to evangelize what we're doing and uh, looking forward to the launch in, uh, by the end of the year. Okay, is there a link that we can tell these folks to go yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. Rchain.coop. Okay, awesome. And then there's reflectadventures.io. Okay, I think we're about to start our talk, so let's all head over. Yes, sure. Thank you. Cool. Excellent. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us here today. My name is Isabel Ferreira. I'm with Prism Group. a 30-minute presentation. Before the 30-minute presentation, I'm just going to give a word on our sponsors here today. Um, and I ask that you keep all of your questions towards the end of the presentation. We'll have a dedicated time for Q&A uh, from the audience. Um, so first, I'm going to do a quick intro about our sponsors. Uh, the first sponsor is Crypto Oracle. Uh, thank you so much for Crypto Oracle in partnership with Jessica Steffel um, for organizing this event today. She was right here and she's interviewing many of you on the live stream. So Unofficially, you. Jessica and Crypto Oracle for organizing. Um, Crypto Oracle is a venture capital fund um, that focuses on investing in blockchain and crypto companies worldwide. Um, they are um, also experts in media and ICO advisory. So if you are um, interested in learning more about Crypto Oracle, please speak to Jessica or Luke Kerner. Is Luke Kerner in the audience today? No? No? Yeah. Okay, so please speak to Jessica after the event. Learn more. Um, and today one of our sponsors here is Notel. Notel, thank you for providing the awesome space uh, that you're all sitting in, as well as the drinks. Uh, were provided by Notel. Um, and Notel is, um, provides customized spaces for companies, allowing them to cut costs and enjoy the freedom of a flexible lease. They build and design your headquarters um, and support your team's everyday needs and will host thought-provoking events like this one. They also have a 2,000 member network, which includes um, groups like Cheddar, Body Shop, Stash, uh, and Teachable. Um, if anyone here is representing Notel, can you please raise your hands? No? Okay, so you can actually talk to the Notel people. I believe they're over there near the bar if you want to learn more about the space you're in um, or are interested in um, having uh, office space here in this um, particular building. Um, lastly, I'd like to say a word about Prism Group. Uh, we are a blockchain-focused economics and governance firm, and we have a team of Harvard PhD economists that um, basically do consulting on token economics and provide um, long-term platform sustainability for uh, blockchain companies. Um, so we are actually really excited to announce our um, that we're designing a course for MIT Media Lab. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, it's actually going to be the first uh, crypto economic course uh, ever uh, hosted at MIT. 
So we're really excited to be designing that in partnership with them. And if you'd like to learn a little bit more about that course, you can check out our uh, Medium channel um, at uh, MIT Crypto Economics. Um, so, okay, enough with the housekeeping. I'm going to uh, give you a little bit of information about Civil. Uh, Civil is a decentralized marketplace for news with the mission of supplying, distributing it, and protecting its ideals. Civil believes that journalism as we know it um, is in need of a new model because the ad funded revenue that we traditionally have used um, in, in journalism um, simply has not translated to the current digital economy. Um, jur journalism, we believe, is a free fundamental uh, pillar of democratic societies, um, and newsrooms around the world are facing an existential threat, um, as we all know, um, to, uh, journalist uh, to uh, journalism. Civil is committed to introducing a new way forward that enables journalists to focus on actual journalism and not on the clicks over quality mandate that third parties like advertisers and publish publishers are demanding. Um, this includes, Civil uh, has committed over $1 million towards helping dozens of journalists create independent newsrooms whose work will appear on the Civil platform this spring. Um, these newsrooms include um, and will cover areas that are hardest hit uh, by the current issues in the industry, which are local, investigative, policy-oriented, and international journalism. Nicole is responsible for recruiting and supporting the first fleet of newsrooms on the platform, including helping them thrive and overcome challenges. And you'll hear a little bit more about that during her talk. Um, she has spent the past 17 years as a reporter and editor in New York. Uh, she was a founding member of DNA Info, which was an award-winning news site that serves, served readers in New York City and Chicago. Nicole also served as DNA Info's first uh, data visual, visualization editor and oversaw breaking news as well as day-to-day -day newsroom operations. Previously, Nicole spent eight years as a reporter for the New York Daily News. I'm sure you have many stories about that, um, where she covered a range of areas, including national and international journalism. Um, she has a Bachelor's of Arts from Columbia University, and she is also an adjunct professor at uh, the New School's uh, Narrative and Design Program. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Nicole. appreciate you guys all coming out and, uh, and thank you so much for being here. Show of hands, how many of you guys come from a journalism background or are interested specifically in journalism? How many are from a blockchain background? And how many of you guys are specifically interested in crypto? Cool, so kind of a spread. Um, so I will tell you that when I first came or when I even first heard about Civil, um, I didn't know a thing about blockchain and I didn't know a thing about crypto. I just knew that three journalists who I respected and admired very, very highly um, were talking to me about this crazy thing that the, this chain of code and this thing with indelible archiving capabilities and that maybe there'd be some financial component like Bitcoin and that that was kind of the first that I heard when I first started getting into the idea of civil. Over the course of probably, I guess it took me about three or four months to really wrap my head around it. And then it took me, I guess, about another three or four months to finally be able to explain it in words. I don't know that I'm 100% there yet, but I'm definitely a lot better off than I was this time last summer. Um, so I am the head of newsroom sustainability, and originally I was the head of newsroom strategy. Um, but like any good startup, my role has changed about maybe 15 times in about um, as many weeks. So um, right now, a day-to-day -day for me looks like talking to these fantastic journalists who have taken the plunge, left everything that they've known in the publishing, you know, such as it is, journalism world, 
and come into this kind of like matrix for them, right? Most of them, they don't know what MetaMask is, they don't know what a hard wallet is, they don't know what a Trezor wallet is, right? This is like, we are talking to them, you know, future sci-fi stuff right now. But the thing that they, the thing that they are constantly hooked on is the same thing that hooked me, which is um, when I was at DNA Info, we spent eight hard years building up day by day by day this archive of stories that we put our blood, sweat, and tears into. We, we fought city agencies over the information. We would have to, you know, get these sources to give us these stories, and then we get them onto the web. It's on our central server. It's there, right? That's what you have to look back on when you are a journalist is your clips. Um, so any of you guys that might be familiar with specifically DNA Info, but then any number of news organizations have faced similar things, the minute the central server is either taken down, as in my case, eight years of archives wiped in a day when our news organization was shut down, or in the case of Gawker, sued out of existence, right? So there are a number of ways that archives can go down. Maybe sometimes it's just link rot. Maybe sometimes you just have a story that's really old that you know, in, in the case of stories that I wrote for the Daily News in 2001, that was kind of pre-digital in many cases. So maybe it was a print story, maybe they put a version of it online, but they don't necessarily want to sustain it forever and ever and ever. So there's like a version of a story that's probably been compressed down so that they can store it pretty cheaply, but it doesn't look like what it looked like, right? So then any kind of an archive that may have once existed, any kind of permanent historical record, which Journalists aren't the only ones that feel strongly about it. History buffs feel strongly about it, right? Like 30 years from now, are we gonna look back on this day? What is there gonna be to show for it? You know, maybe there's a few print publications that are still making it into microfiche, but the Library of Congress is overwhelmed. They're drowning. They can't even, it can't even archive every tweet, much less every single news story. And then there's a lot of news outlets that, you know, are just new. And maybe they're really good and they're new, but nobody knows yet whether to trust them enough to waste the time to permanently archive their stuff. You've got the Wayback Machine, but that's got its own problems, right? And that's just the work of one really, really passionate man, right, who feels really strongly about this. So that was the sort of backstory for myself and a lot of the journalists that um, chose to come on to Civil is there's gotta be a better way for a lot of parts of journalism. There's gotta be a better way for how we can keep the permanent historical record preserved. There's gotta be a better way for us to be able to come to work every day and get paid a living wage and not worry that our company is going to shut us down at any moment. There's a lot of news organizations that have been kind of starved out by attrition and maybe nobody's been fired exactly, but they have to do you know more and more and more stories and they're kind of less and less and less investigative and more, less and less and less original and more and more and more aggregation. And so at a certain point, it's sort of not the journalism that people got into the industry to do. So enter blockchain, right? So you have this new technology, which many journalists are super jaded of new technology. Because many journalists have been promised this, this is the thing, this is the thing that's gonna fix journalism, right? Facebook, Facebook's gonna be a thing, it's gonna fix journalism, or like Google AM, that's gonna fix news. Everybody's gonna be able to read your story, and here we are, and there's still people just, just being slashed by the day. And, Probably, I think there was, uh, there's some statistics out there and I don't have them off the top of my head, but the number of journalists that are losing their job every single day and the number of news deserts, like the number of towns that used to have, I think at least two major news outlets has dropped some precipitous amount. And most news, most towns are lucky to have one place that covers them. New York City, right? You think, oh, New York City, we're the head of media. We should have a million places covering us. Wall Street Journal, Greater New York, has been slashed almost to non-existence. The New York Times has had to make really hard choices about what they can cover and how far they have to stretch their journalists. DNA Info doesn't exist anymore. You know, Patch, thank goodness, is coming back a little bit, um, a lot bit. And, um, you know, there's a lot of places that are still doing good work, but the ability to sort of saturate a market isn't there to the extent that maybe it once was. The Daily News is still doing good work, the New York Post, whatever you may think, right? It's still here. It's a good thing in the eyes of a journalist, it's a good thing to have competition. It forces everybody to be better, it keeps people accountable, right? So having a diversity of sources is a good thing, especially 
in the current climate when people don't trust journalists to be human, right? So you guys are probably will not surprise you that this is an era of fake news, right? People like to accuse news that they don't maybe agree with of being not real. So it's a hard time to be a journalist. Um, so what does the blockchain do, right? So I had a whole slide presentation for you guys, but it would involve putting you all into utter darkness. So instead of just going to tell you what the slide says, instead of subjecting you to it. Um, so what one of the things the blockchain can do for journalism, particularly in the case of civil, is that it allows the transaction over a story or over a series of news stories to be directly between you, the reader, and the journalist writing the story. So we don't necessarily have to have an advertiser. If you know, if there are people who have a great bench, a super deep bench of advertisers who don't expect editorial, you know, favors in exchange for their ad dollars, great. But if you're like most journalists and you don't necessarily want to kill a story just because your advertiser doesn't like it there might be another way for you to come up with a sustainable business plan that involves actually getting people to pay you for the work that you do, which is kind of how it used to work a long time ago. Um, there's also, you know, the, one of the big parts of Civil that we're really proud of is that we have come up with an, a community-based platform that is going to allow the journalists coming onto the platform to be voted on by the individuals that are all part of the civil community. So you could read a story on civil and you could not know a thing about crypto. In fact, we encourage you to come and read things on the newsrooms that are going to come onto civil and don't read anything about crypto, don't have any crypto, don't have a wallet. You just read a story and you can pay with your credit card if you want to. But if you feel like you want to be involved in the community, you want to be involved in the governance, you want to be involved in how day-to-day -day -day decisions are made on a sort of a, a important kind of core level, the thing that unlocks that for you, the way that you get involved, is the, to is the civil token. So the civil token is a governance mechanism. So what does that mean practically? So what that means practically is that in order for a newsroom to be able to apply to join the civil, they have to have a token to be able to put down as their application fee, which shows they care enough about joining this platform over all other platforms that they're willing to get this, you know, cryptocurrency and they're willing to put it down as their application. So what happens next? So anybody who has a, a token is um, among the group that can vote on whether that newsroom can come on. Are you, any of you guys familiar with AdChain? They just went out with TCR. So TCR stands for Token Curated Registry. So that's so basically that means that like all of you in the audience, let's say all of you have a token, you all get to participate in this registry. And the registry in our case is newsrooms. So each newsroom is an individual entity. They run themselves, they have their own editorial strategy, they have their own business strategy, they make their own decisions. We do not tell them what to do. They are their own, they are their own unit. So they say, okay, I want to be on civil. So they put down their tokens, they enter this process of application. Then everybody in this room who has a token takes a look at their application, takes a look at what we have, which is called the civil constitution, which is based in all the sort of journalistic ethics. Do you, you know, check your sources? Do you have a history of correcting your errors if you find errors in your stories? Do you fact check your stories, right? So things that most self-respecting journalists think of as just day-to-day, -day, mindless, this is what you do. If you have an error, you correct it. You tell people that you corrected it. If you have an editor's note, you have an editor's note. So based on the civil constitution, people can look at that application, and if there's something really egregious about it, like, you know, hatespeech.com, right? So then you can, you can look at that and you can say, I challenge this application on the grounds of the civil constitution says that the newsrooms have to be, you know, honest dealers and they have to be in it not to disparage, you know, certain groups or whatever the, you know, whatever the line is that you find in the constitution that you believe is being violated by this news organization. So you will, um, you will put up a token, or however many tokens the state is, is called for, to challenge this newsroom. And then everybody in this room gets to vote whether they agree with the application or whether they agree with you. And the incentive for you to do that and to spend your time looking through these applications and saying, I like this one, I think this one is in keeping with the, the values of this constitution, or you know something about this one and, and the history of this journalist, think it could be a problem and I'm looking at this part of the Constitution and I think they violate this clause. The, the reason that that's valuable to you is not only because you believe in the quality of the journalism and you believe in 
this platform being a place where people can have a conversation, they can read news that they trust, that is high quality, that is not fake. And the other reason is because you have a direct financial incentive. If you win, if the people vote with you, and they agree that you flagged a problematic newsroom, and then you, your challenge is approved by the community, you get some civil votes back. So it's this self-sustaining you know, community that builds momentum, that the idea is that everybody has a say, everybody has a vested interest, and everybody wants what's best for the community, which is what the sort of the crypto economic model is, that it's self-interest as well as public interest. Um, so I just covered a lot of ground. Should I stop? <laughs> I know you have a question for Tana. Yeah. Um, so you explained a little bit about how a newsroom or a media company would get on the platform. Um, is it only through this token process that they would be able to get on the platform, or are there other ways? Good question. So right now, because we don't exist yet, right? There's no TCR, there's no civil, there's no platform, there's no token. We're in a pre-launch phase. So all the newsrooms that are associated with us now, and I'll give you a little description of kind of who they are, they're all hand-selected by us, right? So what is, what is less decentralized than that? That's the most centralized thing you can do. This is the tension that we are dealing with on a sort of a daily basis is we are a very centralized entity that wants to become decentralized as appropriately and quickly as possible without just throwing everybody to the wolves, right? So it's like this balance of how do you do this to show people what can be and show people the sort of best possible version of the way that this could go, hand curated, hand picked, sort of models of what this thing is supposed to be while also completely respecting the fact that the whole the whole point of why we're on the blockchain is because it's not up to the centralized entities to make these decisions forever. We've tried that. I've been a centralized journalist my entire career. I'm very appreciative of all the opportunities that I've gotten and it would be crazy for me to say that that's the best possible way that these decisions could be made all the time, right? It works in certain circumstances. I think it's really important for there to be centralized things. I think it's really important for there to be centralized responsibility. When people make mistakes, they should take responsibility for their mistakes. It's really hard to do that if you say, mistakes were made, right? And it's like this ambient <coughs> thing all over the place. But like, if there's somebody taking responsibility, this is my story, it's my newsroom, this was my mistake, I'm going to put a correction on my story, that helps, right? So having some things be centralized, I feel, is appropriate. Having some things be centralized Decentralized, I think, is also appropriate. So I'll give you a little sampler of the newsrooms, and then I'll, um, I think there's part of your question I didn't answer, but. Um, so the first newsroom that signed with us, um, back when we were sort of still figuring out all of our, our details, was a newsroom called Popula, led by a woman by the name of Maria Bustillos. And I don't know, you guys might be familiar with her work. She uh, has written for The All, for The New Yorker. She's freelanced everywhere, and she is, hugely, hugely respected in the world of journalism, and she's going to do this, um, she calls it sort of an, an alt-zine type of a thing, but with sort of a global perspective. Um, she, uh, she kicked it off, and then in quick succession, the people that followed on her heels were a, a newsroom called Sludge, that's gonna be about sort of lobbying and dark money and politics, so they are looking into sort of any kind of influence that lobbyists are gonna have on the way laws are written, and I'm sure there's no examples of that, so they will not have anything to write about. Um, <laughs> the third group that joined after that, um, you guys might be familiar with, so my former colleagues at DNA Info Chicago, after DNA Chicago and New York ceased to exist, started up this newsroom called Block Club Chicago, which um, among its many um, honors has been named the most successful Kickstarter in local news history in the US. So I think they aimed to raise something like $49,000 or something, and they raised, I think, $150,000 in, I think, a matter of days, and then eventually over the, you know, the 30-day period of Kickstarter. But, um, so they're um, exceptionally excited to be back Public, you know, able to, to work again. Um, we have a couple other really fantastic newsrooms. Um, so one of them is called Cannabis Wire, and it's a newsroom dedicated to the business of cannabis, um, not from an advocacy perspective, but from the fact that this is going to be a multi-billion dollar industry, already is, and that the number of places that are writing about it in a business way is, uh, is 
there could definitely be more coverage of that subject. So um, we also have Tom Skoka, who used to be over at Gawker. Um, he's started up a news organization called Who Daily. Um, and we have a news organization um, called Documented, which is going to cover immigration, national security, and the NYPD. So a pretty interesting spread, and um, we have a couple more up our sleeves, so we hope to be able to tell you guys about a few more in the next weeks. And when is uh, the platform being launched? So we're looking at Q1, so we're, we're coming up on, we're coming up on launch. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm sorry, Q2. <laughs> it's not next year, I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll we'll survive it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about um, first having a more centralized model. Um, do you plan to move to a more decentralized model as the company develops? Is, is that sort of one of the goals or um, is Sybil going to continue handpicking a few select, select journalists? That's right, so that was the part of the question that I forgot to answer. So, so obviously in the pre-launch stage, we're handpicking all these excerpts, right? In the, in the after-launch stage when this TCR, um, so shout out to Sarah in the middle of the crowd who's one of our um, engineers who's helping us actually design the things. Also to Christine Mohan, who's the head of community and partnerships, who's making it possible for us to be able to support all of this. Um, so once the TCR goes live, that's going to be a primary way that newsrooms apply. Um, so they don't need anything from us at that point. So their existence on the platform is fully in the hands of the people who hold the tokens. And actually, we have very little to do with whether or not they get on um, and whether or not they are taken off. So, um, so yeah. And there, there will be other pathways as well. There's going to be other parts of our ecosystem. Um, for nonprofit organizations, news organizations, as well as for-profit news organizations. Um, so we're hoping that this becomes an, a, a thriving ecosystem as opposed to us, you know, in a headquarters telling everybody the way it's supposed to go. Okay, so it seems like it's, like, they get on the platform and then it's sort of like a hands-off approach, let the decentralization take effect and the community will vote on, on you know, the, journal, the journalism and the merits. So yes and no a little bit, so okay. I'll catch you. So so one of the things that, so a lot of the journalists, being the first experience that they've had with decentralization, the journalists are exceptionally good at thinking about worst case scenarios. I don't know how many of you know journalists, but we're really, really good at it. And so some of the worst case scenarios, among many that we've come up with, are what if terrible people buy up all the tokens and they just want to get rid of all journalists mm -hmm. and they just want to vote us all off and make our lives miserable like all the other trolls we get with all the walk. <laughs> you might wonder, that's a very good question, right? Or um, what do you do if all the people that buy up the tokens are whales and it's just a bunch of billionaires and then all they want us to write about is luxury real estate and you know, blah, blah, blah. So, okay, that's another excellent question. Um, what are some other excellent questions that people come up with? Like, all the different ways. Why are we using blockchain at all? Why don't we just go on Patreon, right? Why don't we, you just want people to pay for news. They can pay for news any other way, right? So these are all excellent questions. Thank you for asking, hypothetical humans. Um, so, so, okay, answer number one. So what if everybody on the platform that buys tokens are terrible people and they hate journalists and they just want everybody off? Number one, that would be terrible crypto economics, right? If you are a crypto token holder and you have a platform full of quality, quality is a good thing for you to be a part of. If you want to ruin the thing and stomp all over it, that would be a bad thing for you. But being journalists, we're not gonna leave it there. So the other thing we did was we added checks and balances. So yes, everybody who has a token can vote on whether platform news organizations come onto the platform or get removed from the platform. The other thing we did is we have a civil foundation whose job it is is to act to monitor the voting, to make sure that the people that are voting are actually abiding by the terms of the Constitution. So if you have a bunch of people who for whatever reason have been swayed to vote a certain way, but the way that they're all voting actually doesn't comport with the thing in the Constitution which they're citing, there is a group that can come on top of that and say, actually, this is a violation and we overturn this vote. 
we're hopeful that that will happen in very, very rare circumstances and that that will send a real message to people that this isn't a game, that these are real journalists with real ethics and that we all mean it when we say vote based on the Constitution. It's not a popularity contest, right? It's not about whether you like this person, you don't like this person. It's about is this person upholding the terms that they signed up to? Because journalists can't come onto the platform unless they say, I agree to abide by the terms of the, Constitu the Civil Constitution. The civil constitution can be amended, right? The community can make a vote to amend it. The foundation can make a vote to amend it. There can be a process, much like our own governmental process, where votes can, you know, affect the, they can amend the existing rules. But it has to be a process. It can't just be kind of like mob rule, basically. So that's the, that's the best answer that I have to the sort of how do you, how do you have checks and balances and how do you keep this whole process honest, <coughs> keeping the journalists honest. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about uh, fake news and what if there's an instance where there is uh, fake news and it's on the platform and at this point now it's decentralized, it's being uploaded, um, you know, and then suddenly there's word. Also, I'm thinking of worst case scenario, but suddenly there's word that there's you know fake news on the civil platform. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, with centralization, it's a little bit easier to point the finger because if there's something centralized, there's a group of people that, you know, are obviously guilty of, of spreading that news. Um, but if something is decentralized, you know, where, who, who uh, is the finger pointed at? Yeah. And, and how, how can we prevent um, this type of news from spreading? That's a great question. So I think, you know, one of the features of the blockchain and this as a very, like, blockchain neophyte is, the sort of fingerprint of the person that, that first published a story, right? So there's an associated, so part of the way in which we plan to publish our stories is we're publishing them to a central server because that's the fastest way to pull them down, that's the fastest way to get them on your phone, that's the fastest way to get them on the website, right? If you had to wait for the blockchain to translate it back to a story for you, you'd probably be waiting a while. But in addition to putting things on the central server, we're also gonna be publishing things to the, we're gonna have smart contracts that are constantly pushing every time a new story is committed. There's, a, there's so I'm explaining this poorly, but we're going to be having a smart contract every single time a story is published. So every single time there's a newsroom that has a wallet that publishes a story, it's going to be published to the smart contract. It's also the contents of the story, the newsroom has the option to publish them to the Ethereum event log so that actually the body of the story can be permanently saved as an interim measure until some other option opens up like IPFS or something like that. So we have options available for redundancy, which is a good thing. When you have one central place, it's easy to delete. If you have it in the event log, it makes it much, much harder to delete it. So um, remind me, so you were saying about the sort of how do you stop it from spreading. Yeah, so, so in the way that you already now have this story associated with this newsroom at this published time, at this published location, there very much is a sort of clear line of responsibility of who this information came from first. And a lot of places are using the blockchain for licensing. So, you know, Ujo and sort of music platforms and places who want licensing because they actually want, they want the bragging rights. This is mine, this is mine first. So in some ways actually it makes it more indelible who it came from first, and then everyone can see who it came from first. So there's a huge incentive for people to get it right, and then there's a huge incentive for people to correct the record when they got it wrong, because everyone can see that they got it right, and everyone can see that they got it wrong. So best, best case scenario, it would actually hopefully make it a lot easier. Great. And um, you mentioned a little bit about the civil constitution. Um, how can you ensure that people on the civil platform are abiding by the civil constitution? Um, is this more of a, is there any sort of monitoring process or is it more of a self-regulation type process? I know, I think you mentioned, you touched on it just briefly, but sure. if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Absolutely, so I think, you know, partially it will definitely be self-monitoring because if you know that you can be voted off for egregiously flouting these rules, Hopefully that gives you a bit of a, um, it will make you think twice before just putting stuff up that you clearly, you know, haven't read it, that you clearly, you know, I think it's interesting when I hear sort of fake news, I sort of feel like a lot of times people use it and they don't even really understand what they mean sometimes. So like, depending on whose mouth it's coming out of, it can either mean news you don't agree with or an act, something that somebody got wrong. 
But it wasn't fake. It was that either they got it wrong because their source got it wrong, or they got it wrong because the person who gave it to them from the official city agency got it wrong. Right? There's lots of different ways for people to get information wrong, some of which is intentional, some of which is unintentional. Right? So like, there's a whole spectrum of information that ranges from like actively trying to give people wrong information to mislead them to like doing the best you could with the information that you had at the time that you had it on deadline. Right? So like that, for what it's worth, is like. There's a big, big gray area in there. So I think, you know, I think most newsrooms that are trying to do this for the right reasons, they're trying to get this information right. I don't, I don't personally know any journalists who are like, you know what I'd love to do today? I'd like to make some stuff up, publish it with my name on it. That would be awesome, right? That's not the people that usually get into the line of work, right? So, um, um, so all of that is to say that I think that there's going to be a self-check happening of people who are. They are aware that their stuff is out there, people can read it, they know their names on it. It would behoove them to want it to be good and right and for them to, when they get something wrong, to make it clear that they got it wrong and to correct the record. Um, I think also, if there's a room full of people who can make money on my mistakes, they could maybe keep me honest, right? So if, if everybody in this room is looking out for, for egregious stuff, I'm not talking about typos, I'm not talking about, you know, um, you know, transposing things in a sentence because I was rushing, right? But if, if you guys are out there kind of the eyes and the ears, you're a first line of defense for, for catching egregious errors or repeated errors. There's also, you know, the Civil Foundation that it will be their job to sort of monitor as well. So kind of multi, multi tier. Okay, great. I think um, if the audience has some questions that they'd like to ask, um, we're ready to take them. Hi, yeah. So you talked about how, just trying to clarify that the newsroom agencies would apply, um, then they'd be verified by the community. Um, have you guys explored at all the idea of? actual community members staking tokens on curating their own um, newsrooms and then proposing it to the community. So I kind of think that like if it's only, like you're kind of somewhat incentivizing watchdog behavior a little bit by like, here's the constitution, here's the ethos, does it match up versus actually the critical thinking and value adding of like, I think this could be useful for people to read. Um, so just wondering if you've thought of all about that if you have what were the words that just like you decided to pretty much centralize your role versus decentralize it? So I think I understand, but I'm just going to repeat it back to you to make sure I understand. So you're saying that if a, if a community came together, either geographically or just of its subject interest, and said, I don't see anybody covering this subject, this subject is important to me, I would like to find journalists that will be willing to cover this. Is that essentially what you're saying? Yeah, so somebody that, um, a consumer that's on, on the chain, staking tokens, in order to say, I'm, I'm vetting this, either individual journalists or this individual newsroom, but then if they get accepted by the rest of the community, they are monetarily awarded. I see what you're saying. Yeah. So I think there's two, so there's two things about that, both of which actually have been things we've talked about, and um, you know, obviously the way that we're gonna go out when we launch is gonna be sort of a beta version, right? So it's like, this is gonna be our first version, and I think it's, we're gonna, like many good journalists, we're gonna iterate over time, but I think that if what you're suggesting is that, either people can pay for journalists who can't pay for themselves to start up a newsroom, or that journalists can basically imagine a newsroom that nobody else has imagined yet and say, hey journalists, come and do this cool thing, and we're putting up the money, and then like you can find your own money like, once you start, but we're your audience. We really, really want you, and please come. Both of those things are definitely things we've talked about and are fantastic ideas, um, because I agree that um, the, the best way forward for news is going to be two direction, right? So if it's just a bunch of journalists around being like, I know what everybody wants to read and it's going to be this, right? That's kind of the way it's always been and that's a problem. So I think what you're suggesting is that people are initiating the coverage and that journalists are responding to the people who are initiating the coverage. I think that's absolutely what we're hoping will happen. I don't think we have a, we don't have a process for it yet um, because it's been hard to sort of get this far, um, but I definitely think that that's, I think that's what some more hoping to do. Oh, okay, we'll go left, right, yeah. Uh, 
so, so I love what you guys are doing. Um, I think it's a great idea. But I'm still a little confused with relation to uh, the content that's published that is purposely false or misleading, or you know, just make a mistake. How do, we, how do we fix that? I know you mentioned something about self-reporting. What if, uh, so what if a, a journalist or a newsroom continually, continues to publish false information? How's that being tracked? So in, in um, let's say I'm a newsroom, I've written four stories, all of which have just been blatantly fake, right? Blatantly false or blatantly wrong in a real meaningful way. You read all of them and you have some tokens. And you say, that's it, I'm done with this, challenging this newsroom. So the TCR that we're creating, you would basically like plug in, I don't know if you literally plug in your URL, but you plug in the newsroom address and you say, I challenge X newsroom based on this story, this story, this story that violates this part of the Constitution, click. And it goes out and everyone in this room can see it and everyone in this room gets to vote on it. And if they all agree with you, that's it. Good question, thank you. <coughs> okay, yep. Right here. Uh, you mentioned that in terms of payments, anybody can pay or any stories, they don't care for the user credit card. So as a reader, am I paying for a story? Am I subscribing to a journalist? Am I subscribing to a newsroom? And how are these payments? Because if you're talking really small amounts with micropayments, it's really expensive with credit cards. Yep, that's a really good question. So um, it's the answer to your question is twofold. So every newsroom is going to have their own um, uh, business strategy. So some newsrooms, their experience is that, for example, um, Block Club Chicago, they want their stuff to be available to people whether or not they can pay. They also want to be able to get paid for stuff that people can't afford to pay for. So they're experimenting with a sort of a metered paywall style, right? So that they would have some stories that everybody can read, breaking news stories, for example, it's not unusual for certain paywalled sites like the New York Times or the you know, Wall Street Journal, that if there's certain breaking stories, they'll make them free, right? Because it would sort of be inappropriate to charge people for like a terrorism story or like a hurricane how to get safe, get a safety story. So there's, there's sort of a precedent for people making certain stories free and certain stories paid only. So some newsrooms are experimenting with that. Some newsrooms are experimenting with, this is the level for sort of consumers, this is the level for sort of um, people who are looking to invest in you know, cannabis. These are the sort of people that are in the industry or they're sort of at the business level that they would, three tiers of levels of willingness to pay, give you three tiers of access. So every newsroom is kind of doing it a little bit differently. Um, and so each newsroom's business model is going to kind of be unique to them. Um, to your point about that if you're paying on a per story basis, like if you're micro-tipping, which we are planning to do, it gets very expensive if you're just tipping a couple of bucks or whatever, and they're taking 3% off the top. Um, so in that occasion, we're going to have that you could potentially only tip in crypto, right? Because otherwise, any amount of money that you would do would just get shaved off to the point of like non-existence. So um, I think that each individual newsroom's business model is going to be different, but right now, exactly for the reason that you're mentioning, we're thinking of certain things, because also, if you try to subscribe in crypto, the, the way the volatility would make it very hard for you to know what you're paying next month, right? So right now, there's no there's no plan to have subscriptions be in crypto, but there's plans for there to be micro -tipping. Okay, we'll work backwards to forwards, so who cares? <laughs> uh, so first of all, I just want to say that was one of the most comprehensive and articulate presentations on crypto that I've seen, so thank you for that. Um, and also, the symbol reminds me a lot of uh, Stima and um, let's say the one EOS as well, the constitutional platform, both of which were developed by the programmer Dan Larimer, as well as he was also the co-founder of, Bit, of uh, BitShares, I believe. So is there any specific inspiration or within the cryptocurrency universe that inspired someone? And oh man, that's such a good question. I don't know if I really answer that. So do you know what the sort of source inspiration was? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long well. Christine Mohan. Hi. Hi everyone. Christine from Civil. Uh, just now become my moniker um, in everything I do. Uh, so imagine a 
young journalism student um, who actually is a, Matthew Allen's our CEO, and uh, who's now 30 and is one of the youngest on our team, which is kind of fun. Uh, he went to school for both um, entrepreneurship, but also one of his first jobs out of college with ESPN. And there he was more on the editorial, but also doing a lot of kind of page ranking <coughs> and learning a lot about uh, analytics and learning the inner workings of page design. He was really interested in that. Um, evolved into running his own marketing agency with his wife for about seven years and helping startups um, develop their audiences, develop revenue strategies, um, succeed. So we then sold it to an agency in Boston and ran that um, as I think CMO for a year or two and just started tinkering. It always been very interested in journalism and just realized it was a broken business model. He knew the inner workings of Facebook and Google and everything was going on with even before programmatic, but it was certainly when programmatic was starting, and all the things that were starting to erode the edges of, of journalism, and really um, the money was just shrinking, and certainly the revenue share was going to very small um, areas of the business, which were basically Facebook and Google. So he literally, as he talks about it, went into his basement to think about things, and to think how can we solve this problem in a way that's interesting, and uh, started looking at different technologies, started looking at different concepts, business models, um, revenue models, and uh, separately um, through context, someone introduced him to blockchain. And so we started to muse on that. He just did a ton of research, learned as much as he could, and slowly put the two of them together. And then over time, came up with this model for Civil, which is still evolving, but um, myself, when I learned about blockchain, I came to blockchain uh, about a year ago, learned about Consensus, which is the largest um, Ethereum uh, incubator. Uh, based in Brooklyn, I was like, I've got to work for Consensus. They are like, doing all these interesting projects, which you mentioned Ujo, a lot of media projects, a lot of things around privacy and rights, and uh, and then I uh, noticed that there was a small startup called Civil that um, was married to journalism and blockchain, and it's just a really, really interesting concept, and we're excited to launch it. Can't wait to launch it, actually. And what's interesting is if you join our Twitter or Telegram channels, um, it's not only are we getting a ton of interest from US, but around the world, we've got people saying good morning, good night, 24 hours on Telegram, and there's a need not only in the US, but certainly in a lot of countries that are dealing with censorship and uh, uh, attacks of the press and, and lack of press freedom for, for many years and generations, so there's a ton of interest overseas as well. All right, long story short, thank you for asking. I didn't know the answer to the question.